Good morning. My name is Maurice Crespi. We're here today for another Cobra webinar. Um, we have Singular who will be presenting today. The topic is the rebirth of South African energy. How could energy support economic growth post COVID? So really, really interesting. It's a webinar that's provided uh, by Cobra. Cobra is a pro bono initiative. It has over 55 partners. Uh, the idea behind Cobra is that we provide pro bono assistance to businesses in distress in whatever form from a uh, spaza shop level all the way up to, to, to big business. And part of the pro bono initiative is that we hold, host these webinars. We also have a great website for the knowledge base at www.cobra.org.za uh, or send us an email at info uh, at cobra.org.za uh, and we can set up private meetings uh, with you and your team um, in relation to any discipline uh, that you may require to assist your business. So handing over to uh, Lorenzo and his team of Singular. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Uh, once again, your contribution is invaluable. So we're really, really grateful. Thanks, guys. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Maurice, for introducing us. Um, it's Annaline from Singular, and I'd like to take some time to actually introduce our facilitator and guest speakers for today. So. Without further ado, we have Lorenzo Tenkati, who is our facilitator and key presenter. He's actually a routine guest at COBRA, offering insight on virus, economic impact, and most importantly, practical business um, advice for management. He's a serial entrepreneur and investor, um, and actually the co-founder of two global companies, uh, one being Singular Group, which is a global management consult consulting firm, and the second being Winterberg Group, which is a private equity firm. Um, through these businesses, Lorenzo has actually been a member of South Africa's Young Presidents Organization since 2014, where he was involved in a lot of energy projects in South Africa. We have Tapelo Mokati, who is the co-founder and executive director of Shumba Energy, a Botswana-based listed company, and what's interesting is he has over 20 years of experience um, involved in entrepreneurial ventures within mining and energy projects. We have Calalberto Gugluminotti. Um, he's the CEO of Energy EPS, or NG EPS. Um, this is a very interesting company. It's focused on energy storage systems, microgrids, and e-mobility. Um, through his leadership in the energy storage space, Calalberto has actually been recognized as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum in 2020. And last but not least, we have Stefano Marani. He is the CEO of Renigen, which is a dual listed company that's based in South Africa. And it holds substantial reserves in natural gas and helium, um, which includes the free state. Um, he's also one of the only holders of onshore petroleum production in South Africa. So today we actually have an amazing pool of what I would call energy entrepreneurs. Um, and Lorenzo, I hand it over to you to take us through the webinar. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks, Annaline. Can you see me? Can you see me properly? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Annaline, and thanks everybody to uh, uh, for joining. And thanks a lot uh, for uh, the whole panel. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an honor. To have you to have you guys here and uh, look forward to a fruitful discussion maybe just to to kick it off um and and as a quick reminder of what is the objective of singular compass which is very much of a pro bono initiative which we started at the beginning of uh, the COVID crisis in south africa and of which this is the eighth uh, edition um as uh, most of the most of you by now know we then will share a longer report uh, during the course of today or, or tomorrow, and we share it on publicly on uh, on LinkedIn. And the purpose is very much one of trying to to in this in the middle of this 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 time of of crisis and confusion to try and provide as much as possible a level-headed source of input for decision makers, uh, mostly business decision makers. Those are the ones that we can cater most for, uh, but also. Possibly we can be of help to, to some extent, informing uh, policy decision makers. The second objective is obviously to be as practical as we possibly can. The only way we can provide some level of help is being practical, so stuff that can, can lead to, to change tomorrow. 
uh, we'll be very transparent. We always uh, stay true to our, our desire to be very transparent about what are the known unknowns. So we're finding out a lot about the virus and about the, the impact of the virus on the economy and on businesses as we go through it. And we need to be very honest and transparent of what are the variables that we still actually don't know how they will be playing out or what are just hypotheses. And then we'll try to share, and, and, and today is a, is a testament to that, we'll really always try to share our learnings and bring the ecosystem we are part of and the friends of, let's call them friends of Singular that, that are part of our ecosystem to contribute expertise and experience to, 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 guide, uh, to guide decision makers during this crisis, this time of crisis. Excellent. So let's, without further ado, remind quickly the, 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 the typical structure of our webinars and our Singular Compass uh, uh, report. We start off by giving a quick reminder on an update on the health and the economy, because that's where it all, it all started, starts. In particular, we look obviously at the South African impact, because that's where our focus is. And then we, we move into more of a business related topic. We try and be as very as specific as we possibly can. And today the topic is one of very high relevance. Today we look at, can South Africa do something can we tackle uh, uh, and, and use the energy uh, sector and the energy opportunity to sort of launch ourselves out of, uh, out of the COVID crisis? And if so, how can we do it? And then we'll, we'll launch it into it. You will have obviously a panel discussion where I'll throw some questions uh, to our uh, uh, expert uh, panelists, which Annalene uh, just uh, just introduced and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll leave we we'll leave at the end the space for for all of you attendees uh, to to ask some some questions which Annalene will will read out and address to the most uh, relevant uh, speaker for the question excellent so without further ado let's jump into into it quick updates on the virus i mean here there's not too much uh, 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 to say uh, and, and certainly there's not uh, uh, too much surprise because this is all over uh, the news on a daily basis. The fatality rate in South Africa is increasing. So the trajectory that we've been uh, uh, initially in the first few editions of Singular Compass was tracking South Korea. Now we are moving much closer to, uh, let's say, the bulk of uh, the developed uh, and developing economies that had a, a much higher death rate, unfortunately, on the good side, uh, so if we want to look at the glass half full, uh, of course, we're still only number 46 uh, in the world uh, ranking in terms of deaths per million, which doesn't say too much, but at least it uh, poses into perspective the fact that uh, on a global scale and at a global level, uh, South Africa is still ranking a lot lower. Uh, so it's, it's, it's still a lot better than what it could have been, what it could be, and what it has been in countries like uh, Belgium, uh, Italy, and Spain, for instance, and increasingly also Brazil in the US. Okay. Another reminder, I mean, we'll, we'll, we, we committed to, to always uh, sort of draw scenarios, both when it comes to the, to the virus impact, which you'll see posted on the, on the full report uh, today. We don't have time to go through it uh, during the webinar, and we'll, we'll, we're doing the same, obviously, when it comes to the economic scenario. And we create a base case, a best case, and a worst case for the economic impact onto South African GDP 2020. Uh, our estimates, as you remember, as the, 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 the more, let's say, frequent followers of you remember, is ranging between 10 and 16% contraction of South African GDP. Uh, ranging from the best case to the to the worst case with a minus 13 percent as a as a base case now this is not to depress anybody but I think it's important to to know what we are going towards and uh, prepare for uh, uh, not only the supply effects of the crisis the supply constraint which is basically the lockdown uh, but also the demand effect, which and the consumer spending, the effect on the consumer spending and on the business spending, which will come after uh, the, the the supply effect, and will be obviously more, uh, uh, will have obviously a longer term uh, uh, effect. 
Now let's move into the topic of the day. And uh, I think what's, what's important, very important as a starting point, and this is a, not something that most uh, South African know or appreciate or maybe think about uh, all the time, but South Africa has a rather, in global terms, still has rather uh, a cheap uh, cost of electricity for business. So in other words, we, I mean, we all complain, including myself, about the increasing, increasing cost of energy uh, in, in South Africa, but we're still around about uh, the ninth, at the 19th uh, uh, place in global uh, ranking in terms of cost of energy. And that's not only rather cheap in global terms, but it's also quite a lot cheaper vis-a-vis -vis other uh, BRICS, so other developing, uh, developing economy. Now, this is you know, partly a good news, but partly also a bad news, because obviously it would be unreasonable to expect uh, that as we expand capacity and we tap into new resources, which will require more capital expenditures, that the cost will stay this low. So business must prepare for a generally for costs of energy that is going to be increasing, not necessarily decreasing. Okay. After this, 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 let's say starting point, we move to the next uh, uh, slide. Uh, the other important starting point is that energy is way too important for economic development to not be a number one priority in the crisis or in sort of working ourselves out of the crisis. That obviously is, a, is, a, is an appeal uh, to policymakers. And it's also, of course, an evidence that comes from, I mean, if you look at the, the slide that is, is projected now, I mean, needless to say, the correlation between GDP per capita and, and energy use uh, per capita is, is very, very clear. That correlation becomes a lot looser as uh, economies move towards service-based economies and, and, and as an energy efficiency uh, kicks in and the world is more aware of, let's say, uh, a green agenda. But the, 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 the fact stands that especially in the, at the beginning and in the intermediate stages of development, the correlation is very, very clear. So without a reliable and sufficient uh, and, and uh, cost-effective source of, of energy, GDP growth will be uh, extremely impaired. And the opposite is, is obviously also true. So let's work on energy to, to, to get uh, South Africa out of the COVID uh, crisis. Now, the, the time is, is really now. The time is now because there is already a, an energy gap. So if you think about, about and this again is not particular news, I mean, we all know about the, 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 the load sheddings that we all experience in our, in our South African, South African lives. Lives. That's that's the effect of an energy uh, gap or a gap between demand and uh, and uh, and supply. And the good news is that um, now, yes, we have a threat, which is this energy gap. But also, uh, uh, there is the, the stars are so to speak aligning in that on the one hand, technology has made an incredible amount of progress, and renewable energies have become substantially cheaper than they were uh, 10 years ago. And right now we can say without, uh, 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 even without any subsidies, and I mean, renewable energies are cheaper in many instances, and we'll, we'll see more uh, about this in the next few slides, than uh, the, traditional, the traditional alternatives. So in one example above all, you can see uh, renewables in, the, in, in, in South Africa in the latest, uh, the latest rounds coming in at roughly 40% cheaper vis-a-vis -vis, uh, coal IPPs, uh, which is obviously a gigantic uh, leap forward compared to what we had uh, 10 years ago. Policy is also moving, uh, moving ahead. Uh, not only the world is realizing there is a need to, to, to move towards a, 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 an increasing uh, uh, awareness on, on greenhouse uh, emission, but also regulations are moving ahead in terms of, and that's specifically South African, change mines and we'll speak about this mines have been now granted permission to generate uh, their own uh, energy and this opens up the opportunity for a lot more more players to be uh, uh, more efficient and to be efficient in general uh, and therefore stay competitive now why 
is am I particularly, and we are particularly excited about the opportunity in South Africa. And if you look at the slide now projected, I mean, South Africa has, I mean, we all know about mining natural resources in South Africa, but when it comes to renewable natural resources, South Africa is at least, if not more, uh, uh, endowed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world of irradiation. Look at the Northern Cape, which is on the left side of the slide. The Northern Cape is, if anything, more sunny, more irradiated uh, than the UAE, where Dubai is. And we all know, or some of us know, that in the UAE, there have been bids for energy in the order of magnitude of 13 uh, US dollar per megawatt hour. Now, if you compare these 13 to the 60 US dollar per megawatt, megawatt hour that on average uh, uh, businesses uh, uh, pay uh, ESCOM in, in, in South Africa, the difference is incredible and the opportunity is incredible. So fantastic news in terms of the starting point when it comes to uh, solar energy. It's also an excellent news uh, in terms of, I mean, as we all know, if, if intermittent renewables increase and uh, the more and more renewables are added to the grid, more and more energy storage will be needed because, of course, the wind and the sun uh, 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 shine and blow uh, uh, intermittently and uh, we will and, and certainly there is no sun at night so that requires if you want to create a base load source that really requires on large scale we call it grid scale uh, energy storage now how do we get to energy storage there's a few technologies in the in the uh, different stages in the in the race here I mean we have obviously flow Flow batteries, this is, I'm starting from the least, uh, let's say, uh, known, uh, if you wish. You have hydrogen uh, fuel cells and you have the more traditional uh, Tesla-driven uh, lithium-ion uh, uh, batteries. All of the input material, all of the input minerals, or most of the input minerals that go into any of these technologies, so whether it's fuel cells, whether it's uh, vanadium redox uh, flow batteries or lithium-ion batteries, South Africa is, extreme, is in, the, in the top 10, in, in many cases like platinum, uh, vanadium, and manganese, it's even in the top three, if not the top one, in terms of world ranking of global reserves. So we have an amazing opportunity to play a, a, a protagonist role, not only locally, which certainly is the case, but also globally when it comes to the energy storage uh, game. And on the right side of the slide, just out of you know, contextualization, I mean, this is a, the growth in energy storage demand has already started, will just continue to increase. So it's not, it's, not, it's not a fantasy science fiction story like the one we could have been telling uh, our audience uh, uh, five or 10 years ago. Not, not anymore. Okay. The last point, uh, or the second last point I wanted to make is, is natural gas. So uh, we all think about renewables, uh, which is of course the greenest, uh, let's say, uh, option uh, on the table. We mustn't forget that um, gas in, in and, and we'll, we'll, I'm very curious to, to hear Stefano's view on this uh, later on in the conversation, but I think gas uh, 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 to, to, in the opinion of, of, of many energy experts, uh, will play, including my, myself, uh, uh, I don't. I think it's, it will play a significant role in the transition. And I'm speaking globally now, in, to, in the transition between the oil and, and sort of coal-driven uh, economy into the into the renewable one. When it comes to gas, uh, Mozambique. Uh, the Pande uh, the deposit uh, the Pande deposit is is uh, as many of us know depleting fast um, and and here I mean the, the obvious uh, sort of elephant in the room is that there is roughly a billion barrel of oil equivalent uh, 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 offshore of Kuha um, so there is an amazing untapped uh, uh, extremely large source of or potential source of gas in South Africa. Now let's pause on this and let's ask uh, later on uh, Stefano his, uh, his, his thought about it. Last point I wanted to make and then we'll throw it 
uh, more, uh, we'll open it up to, to the panel. Let's look at numbers. I mean, we all are numbers people. And if you look at the, the cost curves of the different sources of energy, this slide, this very complicated slide, shows the, I mean, the lines, each line is a source of energy. The yellow is sun. Uh, actually, the yellow is sun plus storage. The red one is, uh, is, uh, is sun. Uh, then you have gas, which is the, the gray one, and blue is, is coal. Now, what you see is that in South Africa already today, so if we speak numbers, um, a new solar PV installation produces and, and, and allows us to get energy cheaper than running an existing uh, coal power plant. Now, obviously, uh, you don't get baseload energy out of pure play solar, you need to combine it with some storage or it can only play a partial role. But you can see how the yellow line, which includes already also storage uh, 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 fully, meaning that we are covering with storage, the yellow line represents the cost, covering with storage the whole night uh, shift, uh, uh, let's call it, and therefore transforming uh, the sun into a baseload uh, uh, source of energy. Now that intersection is because of the way especially storage costs uh, per kilowatt hour is decreasing, uh, that yellow line will soon intersect uh, the other sources of energy, especially coal in South Africa. When I talk about soon, we, we're thinking in the range of 2028 to 2032, which means of course that a lot before that, you can apply only partially storage and sun and already beat uh, or substitute part of your traditional source of energy and save money at the same time. Now, without uh, any more, uh, um, uh, let, let's throw it to the panel. And I, I would love, uh, Tapelo, thanks a lot for, for joining uh, the panel. It's a pleasure to, to have you here. I would really love, given your expertise and experience uh, at Shumba and in other roles, uh, I would love to, to, to have your view on, on, on how, how is self-generation, what, what role will self-generation play uh, when it comes to, to, to large power users such as miners in South Africa and in general in Sub-Saharan Africa? What's your view there? Hi, Lorenzo. Thanks a lot uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I mean, self-generation is really a game changer within the industry. You know, if you look at the output uh, for mining in the last uh, 10 or so years when we've been struggling with electricity has been declining. So self-generation will allow the mines to have certainty of power and to be able to invest more in new production, which is something that has been, that has been lacking. You know, the currently, the, you know, mines that are operating now, we're only looking at the current production, but not many of them are investing in the future, in the future, in the future production, increased, increased production. So self-generation is going to play an important role in terms of providing certainty for, for the future. So it is, it is a, it's a step in the, right, in the right direction. And is there anything, uh, okay, that you make a very good point on certainty and predictability. I also believe that that's, that's been that much more than the, the cost per se has been the biggest hindrance uh, for new investments, uh, both in, in, in mining and in energy. Uh, and, and in the last few years. But in this respect, is the regulation now, if you want, clear enough and sort of the, does it provide the right level of predictability and the right level of certainty if you are to invest in uh, self-generation and, uh, and therefore new capacity in whatever it is that you're doing, like mining? You know, when this uh, call was made for, for mines to be allowed to do self-generation, I think people wanted a process that would be very expeditious, you know, a process that will not be bogged down by regulatory processes, lengthy regulatory, regulatory processes. So what has been released so far, you know, in terms of allowing self generation only speaks to one part, which is the generation, that you can be able to generate to supply your own, your own uh, uh, plant or your own mine. But what has not been clear uh, is exactly how, you know, if, if, production, for example, let's say if you don't have on-site capacity, land to put solar, how far can you put a plant? 
And if you put the plan far away from site, how easily can you connect it to the grid to be able to supply to supply your mine? And if you do that, uh, let's say you are looking at the mine to say, you know, what, if I'm going to be increasing production uh, in the future, then I'll need to have spare capacity of electricity. But by the time, but during the time when you're not using that spare capacity, can you create that excess excess electricity? So those are things that needs to be very clear because I think once you complete that cycle of uh, of, of generation of uh, uh, transmission and uh, feeding, being able to sell back to the grid, therefore you have it makes it easier for people to model the the project and the viability of doing your own self generation. Without any of those things, it still creates a whole lot of uncertainty that will you know hobble the whole process of self generation. Okay, makes sense. So, so, so let's say cl clarifying the transmission and distribution part, and and also clarifying the ability to sell back to the to the grid excess uh, excess energy. These are two of the key points. Absolutely. Um, that's that's that's, uh, that's 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 all very good point. I would agree to that. And is there? Is there any, I mean, what role does the broader economy need to play? That does it, because uh, obviously it goes uh, hand in hand. What, if you are thinking about energy generation, what, what, what needs to come from the broader economy? You know, to make an example, uh, Lorenzo, you know, mining works with, works hand in hand with industries like manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna have increased production, therefore you're gonna need more inputs into the mine to be able to achieve that. But if, manufacturing companies don't have uh, electricity. Therefore, it's going to undermine the whole ecosystem of, you know, general, of self-generation for the mines, but we don't have, uh, we don't have, we don't think about the broader economy to say any other uh, sector that's going to increase the capacity if you want to, to recover from COVID is going to demand, it's going to demand electricity. And not many companies are going to do, be able to do self-generation. So you need to be, as, as a country, as we're thinking about this thing, we need to be very systematic on how uh, the entire economy is planned so that the energy needs or the energy uh, generation that we come up with, it's whole comprehensive. It's not only looking at, you know, uh, I as a mine, I'm surviving by myself without looking at, at, at the broader economy. In the broader without that, you know, uh, you're going to you're going to run into problems as a as a as an economy as an industry. So I like because my electricity is utility ultimately, and it's a utility that want to be expanded across across the, across the economy. So you'll expect that governments, policymakers, think broad about the about the about the economy. I've seen documents released by both Business for South Africa and the ANC. You know, post post COVID recovery. Uh, I think they, it needs to be clear from that side that you want to need energy not only for, for, for the mines and high intensive users, but also for supporting industries. And how do you ensure how do you ensure that? The broader economy. Okay, it's a broader, it's a broader play. Tapelo, thanks a lot. I'm sure there will be questions at the end uh, on these on these topics. Uh, Carlo Alberto, thanks a lot for for joining and uh, and for contributing. I mean, uh, you are uh, obviously extremely experienced in the in the energy storage uh, uh, space, whether that is, you know, hydrogen uh, storage or, or battery storage, what's what's happening in that uh, in that uh, in the in the storage space? I mean, to what extent are we really, you know, ready and uh, uh, to to make uh, to make investments economic there on the international landscape, which obviously applies uh, then also to to South Africa. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, yes, I mean, I totally agree with your introduction. I mean, uh, at the global level, what we, what we have seen in the last five years has been essentially a major disruption of the whole electricity system. I remember in 2015 when I, when I listed um, uh, EPS at the time, now NGPS, uh, there, there was a lot of skepticism around uh, renewables also at the time, uh, but with a lot of interest, and, uh, and particularly on storage, because storage was not perceived uh, as a competitive lever into the, en into the energy system and the energy landscape. So what happened? Essentially, 
In 2015, uh, global installation of storage will, were almost zero, mainly concentrated in uh, Korea, Japan, and China, essentially. While uh, um, essentially those installations uh, come up to eight gigawatts, uh, eight gigawatts uh, on an annual basis last year and they're projected to, to be multiplied by 10 by 2025, okay? Uh, from our perspective, uh, being a, a global player, we have seen it in, in real, I mean, we, we are participating in tenders all over the world, from, uh, from India to China to US, particularly in the US, with uh, gigawatts of tenders all over the world that we signed and that we built. Okay, so it's not anymore, uh, let me say, a science fiction uh, uh, expectation of a global trend, but it's a global trend that has already uh, shaked tremendously the energy system. And this, be this is because of uh, essentially two aspects. First, tremendous drop in, in solar costs, okay, that, that has been the enabler of, of, uh, of energy storage. And at the same time, an even more deep uh, drop in cost of energy storage. In, the, in that specific historical moment is, is for lithium ion and then we all expect uh, the same uh, curve uh, happening also for hydrogen. And that's the reason why uh, at the European level we approved uh, an iconic program for more than 500 billions of investments in energy storage uh, com mainly composed by hydrogen, so hydrogen infrastructure. And that's a natural evolution. So first solar, then lithium ion, then hydrogen. That it was already planned in 2015, but in 2015 we had no evidences on the tipping point. Now we already passed the tipping point, we are in the execution phase. So back to, to, to South Africa. In South Africa, we, we have essentially the same, we see clearly the, the same trends, but with, uh, let me say, a, a, a more intense urgency and a more intense uh, opportunity and, and, a more, and a greater opportunity. Why that? For, from the system perspective, the problem in South Africa is twofold. So from the one hand, you, you have uh, infrastructure reliability collapse. That's the reason why you mentioned lot shedding, rolling blackouts and so on. And this is mainly because of, uh, let me say, a dysfunctional in plant maintenance, in infrastructure upgrade, in grid upgrade, and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in power generation construction. Then the second problem in South Africa that we clearly see is the insufficient capacity. So we, we, we see clearly two, free, two to three gigawatts of, of immediate need, so yesterday, let me say, in terms of power generation. Then, the, and that's the problem of the South African level. The opportunity is what you, you currently mentioned, I mean, huge irradiation data, wind, uh, wind, uh, wind potential upside. I mean, South Africa is best place to lead the energy transition in a country that is 90% uh, coal powered. For historical reason, 90% of the of the energy production in South Africa is is made by coal and renewables. I mean, at the beginning of the decade, we see something. We we have today approximately three gigawatt between solar and wind, then a bit of hydro, but that's that still is a, a negligible portion. Let me say in terms of renewable penetration at the at the um, at the uh, South African level. Then last point uh, is obviously natural resources. Natural resources with 24% uh, of the global resources uh, for, for, for manganese, which is extremely related to lithium ion, and 95% for, for, for hydrogen, not only fuel cell, but also electrolyzer. So <coughs> let me say that that's a, a, a major uh, gift, let me say, to humanity uh, at the South African level, and a tremendous opportunity at the economical level. Because today, the reason why, uh, at least that's my perception, the reason why South Africa is a major coal producer is also because it's a major coal exporter and the coal mining industry has been one of the major employer. Okay, so essentially with manganese and, 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 and platinum, uh, we can 
really transition the energy system in South Africa and also the employment in South Africa and also the GDP in South Africa from a, a pollution-based uh, economy from the energy perspective to a leader in the energy transition. The opportunity is clearly there. The money is also there because if you look to the World Bank programs, I mean, the World Bank already approved uh, uh, 500 millions of uh, of, of investment than backed by the World Bank to invest in storage, okay, in a larger storage project. So storage obviously is not only a way to reduce uh, to reduce the cost of electricity, coupling uh, coupling it with uh, with solar, but it's also a way to support the grid, so to increase the grid resilience and reliability, and and that's the reason why. I clearly see the opportunity for the whole economy, so for businesses, uh, for, for policymakers. Uh, the, the only question I have, but I don't have the answer, is uh, when it will happen, because uh, everything is there. Technologically-wise, we are there. Investors also, as an energy group, we are happy to invest in South Africa. It is absolutely a, a, an investment-grade country from, from our perspective. Uh, uh, Money is there, banking guarantees are there from the World Bank. Question is, where are the RFPs? Because uh, it is a couple of years that we expect the program to be launched by ESCOM. Nothing happened. Now we are talking about other uh, potential RFIs. We clearly see the opportunity, but uh, we, we, are, we are looking to a lack of action let me say, uh, in order to, to make it happen at zero cost for South Africa and declaring a, a tremendous opportunity for, for the whole economy. Thank you. Excellent. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously great to hear that there are, I mean, that not only the time is right, but the willingness uh, uh, from energy, global energy players uh, is, is there to, to invest in the country. I mean, I think, I think really that's, that's, uh, that drives uh, optimism and should drive optimism. Time is there and the rest of the world is, is interested in, in investing. And, which is also obviously very, very important for South Africa, there is a substitution plan. There would be a transition plan also when it comes to the, to, to the employment, uh, uh, um, let's say, issue that otherwise would, would be created in any, in any transition. But now, Stefano, thanks for... For, for joining. Thanks a lot for, 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 for contributing to the panel. What does, what, what role can gas play in this, uh, in this picture, in this landscape? Is there an opportunity there? So, uh, firstly, thank you to the organizers and everyone for having me. Um, <clears throat> the, the role of gas has the potential to be quite a significant one. Obviously, the 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 most recent discovery of brill powder off the uh, off the off the southern coast is quite a significant find, and that gas lends itself particularly well to the um, to the generation of electricity. Um, obviously, it, it will come at a, a quite a significant price tag, but you know, to the point of foreign investment coming into into South Africa. That is a uh, that is an asset that sits in the hands of Total, which is one of the seven world super majors. So there's no doubt that if policy were to meet um, meet business interests, and let's uh, let's for want of a better description say that some of the ideological hamstrings that uh, that South Africa has were to be relented a little bit, there's no doubt that you would see that field bring bring significant power generation online. And uh, and that would be a massive benefit to uh, to to um, let's let's call it greenifying the, the the South African economy. Which, if you if you look at the um, the statistics globally at the moment, South Africa is the fifth worst polluter on the planet in terms of um, CO two per dollar of GDP generated. That that is a serious indictment. Even even some of the even some of the um, the main players in that area, you know, naturally, you think that uh, that some of the other BRICS countries would would have uh, would have worse um, CO two per GDP figures than ours, but that's not true. It's uh, it's not even close. We're, we're none of the other BRICS countries are even close to the kind of emissions that uh, that we're creating, and a lot of that has to do with with the with the technology that we're using with regards to our coal fired power stations. They don't meet emission standards globally, and if um, ESCOM were to play on a level playing field, 
you would see a very quick move towards alternative forms of energy because if you're going to produce coal on an equal playing field to the US and to Europe in terms of your emission standards, the cost of power changes very significantly. And this is, this is closer to your point. You had a slide there a little bit earlier showing that, that um, South Africa was the 19th cheapest power in the world. This is absolutely true. And South Africa, corporate South Africa has gotten hooked onto this notion that power must be cheap in order for the economy to thrive. I'd like to turn that around. I'd like to turn that around completely and say, corporate South Africa, if you actually want to be competitive, then you need to be competitive in many other respects. And you need to be able to produce your goods with the understanding that power is going to get more expensive. It will reach a world equilibrium. It's time for you to evolve or die. And that, that, that's the that's the mindset that corporate South Africa needs to have. Power will not remain at this price. It's it's just not going to happen, um, especially not with uh, with investors globally looking for a much more um, a much more sustainable footprint by companies. Yeah. So the the onus of responsibility is twofold. It's it's not only at a policy level we need to we need to dispense of this ideology that we sit with, but from a corporate level we do need to understand that power is going to get more expensive. And we need to improve our level of competitiveness. Mm. And if we fast forward the 10 years, what, what do you think that the energy mix could look like? If you were to throw a while, the, a while. Look, the, the resources are there. The resources are absolutely there. Um, the, the obvious elephant in the room is, are we going to, as a nation, agree to set up another um you know another platform to talk about the talks that we've had to talk about what's gone wrong with the talks on how to bring renewables online or are we actually going to do something and i'm being a little bit facetious but there is this 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 ardent inability for the country to actually do anything um you know wh one of the ideas that i talked a little while ago and uh, and wrote to escom was why don't we democratize power in South Africa. There are, there are many companies out there that are willing to go the sustainable route. They're willing to pay a premium for power if they know that it comes from a clean energy source. And this is because King 4 for listed companies stipulates that you have to be sustainable. You have to try and get um, as much clean energy as possible. There's a finite amount of clean energy out there. So de facto, the JSE is imposing limits on companies that you cannot, uh, yeah, targets that you cannot meet because the government is allowing it to, uh, to happen. So why not open up the power grid to an auction system? Hmm. Allow IPPs to auction clean power and allow bidders to buy that clean power and ESCOM takes its tariff on wheeling. ESCOM makes money, companies have access to green power and new IPPs come online. And it gives us a just transition because we need that power. We're not going to build any more coal-fired power stations anytime soon. So it's not like we're going to be putting coal out of business. So the unions, the unions' argument also is uh, is completely nullified by this uh, by by this strategy. Okay, that's uh, thanks, uh, Stefano. That's that's clear and and very interesting. I mean, the call for action is obviously is obviously there. And I think you also seem to 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 strongly uh, be a strong advocate of, of the opportunity that is there and, uh, and the resources are there so so very much uh, of a of a call uh, call for action from your from your side excellent let me pass it on to Anneline to to maybe read out uh, some questions that might and please everybody uh, listening in uh, ask uh, any questions you wish and Anneline will will do a, a bit of a selection and pose it to to, to the most relevant uh, speakers. Perfect, thank you, Lorenzo. Thanks panelists for, for the interesting discussion. Um, I think we, we do have some questions here. Um, alternative energy in South Africa is a total disaster. 2010 saw hopeful beginning for considering alternatives, but very short lived. Okay, this is more of a comment. But Marcus says here, how could corporates in South Africa innovate to compact combat the rising electricity prices? And this is a good question. And maybe Stefano, you could take this because you broadly just spoke about it now. Um, you, you challenge corporate SA to innovate, uh, but 
how do they do that, especially given the fact that they're in a crisis right now? Um, does government need to play a role? Um, you know, I think the 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 automatic answer that uh, that government has to has to play a role in everything is 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 arguably one of the hamstrings that we also have. I think it, it is beholden on every every CEO and uh, and the leadership of every company to go out there and make sure that they are um, that they are adopting whatever best practices are. Um, you know, if you if you look at the way to to innovate the way that your company um, manufactures, for instance, let's say, for instance, your company is manufacturing wid widgets. The only way that you're going to be able to do it is if you, if you start taking the, the approach that as a, as a nation, we need to become early adopters of a new technology. Um, there's, there's a sufficient amount of research out there to show that corporate South Africa and manufacturing South Africa are actually relatively slow in terms of early adoption of new technologies. We tend to go for the, for the cheapest upfront capital cost in, in whatever it is that we buy. And we don't pay too much attention to the long-term running cost of, of whatever it is that we buy. And, um, and that, that playoff is, um, is, is one that certainly does hamstring our ability to produce cost effectively relative to, to a lot of other nations. You know, sometimes the cheapest, the cheapest upfront cost is, is, is not the cheapest in the long run. And, uh, and one, one of the things that we need to do is that we need to look at far more efficient energy, um, uh, energy efficient technologies when it comes to things like manufacturing. Uh, got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that. We have an, another question to, by Kaspar, should ESCOM be allowed to participate in the IPP space in the first place? This is an interesting question. Uh, Tapelo, do you want to try and, and answer this? Hi, Alan Lin. Uh, I'm too way about it, but I think, uh, you know, if, if we believe that IPPs, you know, allow a space for competitive bidding, uh, you know, if ESCOM can come up with, with products that, or with generation that is competitive, I, I don't see a problem there because their purpose is on reducing, on reducing cost. But if you have to do that, you have to create an, you know, an even system whereby they don't have a certain advantage over the other, the other players. But certainly if they are allowed to, they need to compete like anybody and not, you know, enjoy any inherent benefits uh, that other players uh, will not enjoy. Got it, got it. Thank you for that. Um, another question from Mitesh Pema. So he says here, gas is generally considered a transition fuel. Fair enough. And how long is this transition period expected to endure given the tipping point between storage technology um, that we're seeing at the moment? So I think Lorenzo, did present that curve which showed that we we're approaching this tipping point. So maybe Stefano, this would be a good question for you because it's related to gas. Or oh, oh, Calalberto, um, I, see, I see that you wanted to answer. So Calalberto, you can go ahead. Um, how long is this transition period expected to endure? I, I will open the door uh, for for uh, for a consideration for Stefano. I think we are we will be on the same page. Uh, frankly speaking, it's a sort of myth that gas is a transition fuel. I mean, uh, obviously, gas can be a transition fuel, but I clearly see the role of gas also in a renewable world. So in a in a in a world fully powered by renewables and storage. Okay, I clearly see the role of gas. While obviously, uh, as far as we consider a major uh, role of hydrogen, this ro role of gas uh, will, will be slightly reduced. Okay, but why that? Because uh, gas gives to the system the flexibility, the full flexibility at the grid level. So if you want to decrease, uh, I saw uh, one of the questions I was saying uh, in South Africa, alternative energy has, has been a disaster. Okay, the question is uh, how we, we make it happen. So how we, <laughs> how we can turn this, this trend? No? Because all over the world has been a major shock and a major achievement simply because the, the marginal cost for dispatching one kilowatt hour of, 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 of solar energy is zero. Okay, so for obvious reasons, it's a trend that you cannot stop. 
You can delay and delay and delay, but you can you can stop electrification. While while, in order to decrease the cost of electricity, renewable is, is a slam dunk. Okay, is an, is obvious. Coupling with storage today, maybe not last year, but today is obvious as well. Gas will continue to provide the flexibility and the resilience at the grid level that also a fully time-shifted solar power to the night will never provide. So I clearly see a role of gas uh, well uh, beyond the role of a transition fuel. Stefano, do you agree? More flexibility um, rather than a transition fuel? Uh, so I mean, the, I, I certainly cannot fault that argument at all. You know, the the truth of the matter is, is that you can also have gas that is one hundred percent renewable. You know, look at uh, look at methane capture from from dumps. Look at um, methane harvesting from uh, from biodigesters. That is one hundred percent renewable, and that that does not require us to change any of the infrastructure that we have today. So why reinvent the wheel? Gas will gas will be there for a very very long time to come. Also, you do need to you do need to pay attention at the cradle to grave CO two output. Um, if you look at the cradle to grave CO two output of a lot of these other technologies, as it stands today and probably for the next twenty to thirty years, gas still produces even if it's mined, it still produces a lower carbon dioxide footprint than than most other most other energies out there. Obviously, completely renewable aside. But it uh, it's 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 got quite it's got quite a long a long time to go. Perfect. Okay. Um, another question here from Marcus and maybe Lorenzo, you can answer this. Um, he says here, given our wealth on mineral resources, I guess you know um, platinum, vanadium. Um, is there an opportunity for the development of a downstream storage market in South Africa? So not just mining the commodities, but downstream storage market. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's uh, the, the, the big advantage here is that there is already a very developed culture locally and ecosystem when it comes to, to, to the mining and, uh, and beneficiation value chain. So I think, uh, you know, also if you think about the, some of the coal uh, 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 employment uh, challenges uh, if and when a transition would happen. I mean, it would be much easier to uh, to tackle if there was a transition into other mining activities, which, which would have obviously a requirement for employment and so on and so forth, and would be activities that require less of a change in, in, in skill sets and, uh, and uh, complete change in skill set, which typically means uh, uh, um, a risk uh, of the transition, not using the same, the same, uh, the same people that are transitioned out of the exiting uh, sector. So I think the opportunity there is, is is gigantic. I mean, uh, uh, certainly from the from the mineral side, so from the early stage of that that value chain, uh, it would require some investment in technology when it comes to the more sort of the later stages of, of actually, you know, manufacturing batteries and researching on, on battery technology and on fuel cell and electrolyzer. But if you think about the interest, the strong interests of the platinum producers, for instance, in, in, uh, in, in South Africa, uh, like, uh, like Anglo-American, surely there is a very aligned agenda there between uh, government, the mining space, and some of the steps in the battery and energy storage uh, value chain. So I see it as a, I mean, the, the early stage of the mining value chain, that's a clear goal and an easy win. Uh, later on, I think it's more difficult, but certainly South Africa has a big uh, advantage and, a, and, and, and it should really be used. And a lot of the interests, especially in the hydrogen, uh, 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 in the hydrogen value chain, are very aligned with the existing existing players. So I would definitely hope so. Excellent. Okay. Um, a question probably posed to Stefano is around natural gas, because there's a question here about what's preventing us in, from developing the offshore asset in Kuka or near Kuka? Um, if the question relates to Brilpada, 
Um, a few things need to happen. Firstly, I believe that Total, um, from what I've read in the public domain, Total are about to, um, to start the drilling rig um, to drill the second well. Um, Brill powder is, is technically quite complex um, because of the depth of the water and, um, and there are three thermoclines with, with raging currents. So it's, uh, it's not the easiest um, spot in the world to drill but they at least they do have the gas so the opportunity is definitely big enough um typically what will happen is that after you've drilled a deep sea well or several deep sea wells and you and you have the gas or at least the hydrocarbon online you then have to build a a, a massive subsea connection that's a few billion dollars and then that connects via pipeline all the way up onto uh, up on up onto the land that's that's the hard part the uh, the easy part is the power station. Most of the stuff is plug and play. Um, so by the time that they're building the subsea connection, they could water the equipment and uh, and it could be up and running relatively quickly. I'd say the the only part that's that's arguably even actually harder than the drilling and the finding of the gas and the building of the subsea cable, uh, the subsea uh, grid connection, is probably getting the production right through the government. That that is that is going to be the hardest task of all. Got it. Got it. Um, I see no further questions from our attendees. So attendees, if you have any final questions, we have a few more minutes with the panelists. Please go ahead and, and post them onto the chat or the Q&A. Happy for us to, to kick off. I think while we wait, I have a question for Tapelo. Um, you mentioned, oh, actually, here we go, Marcus is saying it. You mentioned miners have an opportunity to self-generate. Um, what's, what's holding them back? Is the, are the regulations ready to go? Well, I mean, for on-site uh, generation, uh, I'd like to believe so. Uh, probably the only thing that is not clear is how do you harmonize the Mine Health and Safety Act with the... With the, with the, with the uh, electricity with the NASA, NASA regulations, because uh, I think one requirement that was made uh, when the minister announced self generation was that the new generation that they need not to disturb the current mining operations. So, and which I think many mining companies can can overcome. So the difficulty really will be on when the production is offsite. Uh, hence, I spoke about uh, grid connection. That process may, may be delayed due to regulatory process, getting NASA approval to connect to the grid and, and so on. But for the mines with capacity uh, within their own mining area, uh, it should not be difficult to do. So what may have stopped it, I mean, if you remember, this was done early, early this year. So either the impact of COVID on the commodity prices, uh, but as I guess you emerge from here, you'll start seeing my, mines taking a step to take advantage of that. Because last year, when I think there was a commitment from mines of about 600 megawatts, that we're ready to do self-generation uh, in-house. So I think what it may have stopped them may have been the, the, the okay. impact of COVID, yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect, okay. Um, we have one minute left. So, um, Lorenzo, do you want to close it off? I think we should just pause the, the questions here. But um, attendees, if you have any more questions, we will be posting this document on LinkedIn. Um, you can post your questions there or you can feel free to contact COBRA or, or, or the team. So, Lorenzo, I, I hand it over to you. To thank, thanks a lot to... to uh... Uh, to Tapelo, to Stefano and Carlo Alberto and, uh, and, uh, and yourself and Aline and thanks a lot to, to Cobra for, for, uh, f for, for hosting us and for always pushing uh, uh, and helping uh, during these, uh, these tough times and uh, thanks to all the attendees and I hope we, we managed to add some value and, uh, and contribute some ideas and perspective to the to the current situation and in particular, keeping the energy uh, angle in mind. A much longer and broader and more detailed report, uh, which also will have more information on the virus and the economy, will be posted uh, on LinkedIn. So you can feel free to either follow me or, or, or Singular uh, and you'll, you'll receive the, the document, the public document.
and we hope uh, and we're glad uh, if we we manage to to still be of some of some help good luck everybody and stay safe <laughs>